refactoring your monolith and rails back to this uh, resource and move towards. Okay, this is the thing I'll put on your health network, uh, email, and Twitter. Okay, um, and by Stella, by the way, I, um, uh, I'm not talking about the Stella in the majority term, the kind of WS star type term, but really um, more of a you know, service oriented design uh, type sense, which Brian will uh, talk about. Okay, so today I'm going to tell you a story, and it's a story you probably already know, but I'm hoping that today I can give you a few uh, more few new plot twists and maybe a happy ending. Now this is a story about an, an online marketing company uh, that did lead generation for the education industry. And a single Ruby on Rails app, whose origin started out humbly enough, but over time, right, it grew into, uh, grew into a behemoth of uh, hacked-together functionality, a monolith of duct tape business logic. Now, this application was crucial to the business, but at the same time, it became a real liability. Now, how did this happen, and what did a group of ragtag developers do about it? Well, first, let me start with the application itself. So imagine that you are, imagine that you are, you work at 7-Eleven in the night shift, and you, where you dream about a, a, a brighter professional future for yourself. So you Google around and end up at one of our landing pages where you uh, fill out a survey and we match you up with a school or schools based on your background and your interests, and then we take your contact data and we deliver it to the school of your choice where you spend four years and re-emerge ped newly pedigreed and with a uh, brighter, potential for a brighter potential, brighter professional future, all right? So this is a pretty simple application, huh? And so it was until our business started coming around and to us and, and saying, you know what, you need to remarket all of the emails that we're collecting. So we, quickly hacked together some functionality and pushed it out into production. Then business came back to us and said, you know, we need more complex servers and lots of it. So we hacked together some functionality and pushed it out into production. Then business came back to us and said, you know, we love what you're doing, guys. We love the app. But we also need an admin interface and uh, for all of this functionality that, so we can manage it. And, and by the way, where's report? So we hacked together something, pushed it out into production. Then business came back to us and said, no, we need soap deliveries. So we hacked them together and <laughs> pushed it out into production. And so on and so forth for about four years until we had a real mess on our hands. We had an application that was hard to test, difficult to maintain, full of dependencies, impossible to extend, and a nightmare to deploy. All right. Then business came back to us and said, Hey guys, what's wrong with the site? It's slow, it's, it's buggy, uh, you can't deploy it without something breaking. And it takes forever for you, for you to implement any new features. Um, could, could you fix it now, please? To which we said, uh, you know, it's not that simple, see? Because uh, we have a big ball of mud on our hands. All right, so after much discussion and weighing of options with the business, we decided we couldn't continue down the same road. Uh, we had to kill the beast, in other words, and replace it with something better. You know, thankfully, we worked at a company that had, um, that had smart enough business people that they realized that you know, we had a real problem and gave us the latitude, um, gave a bunch of really you know, excellent developers the latitude to, to do something about it. So, in short, we wanted to go from this to this, from a monolithic Rails app to a distributed set of services written in Ruby communicated asynchronously with each other through a messaging broker like Gravity and Q, um, or, or synchronously through REST or APIs uh, in a Sinatra app, for example. Um, we also wanted to separate reporting from operational data, our operational data store, although um, in this talk I, I won't be focusing on how we transform the data, um, just the, the, the code there. Finally, we wanted that Rails app. Uh, to end up where it began as a simple survey engine. How could we affect this transformation? Well, as we saw, there were three approaches. 
who's rewriting for uh, which doesn't ever seem to work, uh, or you've refactored in the submission, but then, uh, you know, that didn't seem to, uh, uh, this, you know, wasn't something that was going to work in our situation. Or we could strangle the beast. Right, what do I mean by this? Um, the strangler application, which I'm actually calling the strangler approach, is something that Martin Fowler, the term that Martin Fowler coined, um, you know, over five years ago, I think. Uh, and um, think of it this way. So think of a vine, like this strangler fig, growing up around a tree, and gradually killing it until eventually uh, the only thing left alive uh, is the vine, roughly in the shape of the original tree. Right? So with the strangler approach, you don't really fix up existing code. Uh, instead, when you need something new or change, you begin by building fresh uh, greenfield code. The legacy code can communicate with the greenfield code, but access in the other direction is minimized or, or, you know, um, or negated altogether. So, in order to strangle our legacy app, um, there were three main drivers to our approach. All right? So we want to separate responsibilities, do things asynchronously, that's the rabbit, and in queue, when make incremental changes. All right? So, so, let me start with separating responsibilities. In order to separate the tangled layers of responsibilities from our monolithic application and parcel them out as services, we needed to identify the company's core business needs. This, we found, was an effective way to kind of identify and isolate the services we wanted to build on the code level. Those responsibilities were qualifying leads generated by our surveys, uh, delivering those leads to clients, determining how well those leads convert once a client receives them, email remarketing, and budgeting client offers. Okay. For the sake of this presentation, I'm going to focus on two specific responsibilities, which can serve as a microcosm of all, and that is lead qualification and lead delivery. Okay. Now, the problem there, however, was that the business logic for any one of these responsibilities was all over the map. Right? So some of it was tested, some of it was not. How do, how do we identify and consolidate um, in order to repackage it? Right? So one simple approach was to pair with the legacy domain expert when, when one of us worked on a new service so that and we had somebody there who actually you know, understood or knew the, the legacy business rules we needed to implement. Um, but I think more importantly, we did a lot of spent a lot of time reading and refactoring existing tests in our legacy code to identify and understand the behavior there. Um, we didn't have comprehensive test coverage, so if need be, we, could, uh, we would write new tests um, in the legacy code to actually understand and verify the functionality of crucial pieces of the business logic. In this way, we could be confident that we had an understanding of the behavior we needed to emulate in the new system for actually implementing the actual functionality. All right, so let me give you, get more specific. <coughs> test document an application's behavior. If you're lucky enough to have tests in your legacy system, and as, as I said earlier, we were, uh, though, they, though they weren't comprehensive, you can use them as a kind of scaffolding for the behavior of the new system. All right, so this specific RSpec test file describes some lead qualification behavior uh, for phone, zip code, and email, which we wanted to port into the system. But we didn't want to simply copy and paste the ugly code into our new system. Rather, the test here gave us hooks into important business logic whose implementation uh, we could then refactor in the new system. Right? So notice that the logic for validating phone, zip, and email all reside in one class, the lead contact class. So in the new service, however, we wanted to utilize the single responsibility rule and isolate those behaviors to distinct specification classes instead of lumping all of that logic into one big class. So we had two distinct tests, uh, one for phone and one for zip in this case. Um, furthermore, we noticed some redundant behavior in the legacy tests. This gave us an opportunity to abstract that functionality out into a DSL for qualifying a lead. All right? So now in the lead, oh, sorry, sorry. Now in the lead gen industry, um, qualifying a lead is often referred to as scrubbing and you'll see this, the terminology reflected there. Um, validating, validating that the email and phone are not blank is no longer hard-coded. Uh, nor do we need to hard-code the, the um, 
uh, checks for bad boards, but we still allow for customized qualification strategies that can be plugged in to the larger framework. All right, so in all of this, DSL expressed our subdomain clearly and allowed us to easily maintain and extend the service. The scrubber object, moreover, could be controlled by a factory class uh, that could build out varied instances of the scrubber with different behavior for different operational channels. Right? We repeated this process until all functionality relevant to a qualifying lead in a legacy app was imported into the new service. And then we moved on to the next one. Right? In the end, we had single responsibility apps, um, which we viewed as a system level extension of the object oriented principle. Just as the single responsibility rule dictates that a class should do one thing and do it well, uh, we wanted these services to have a single purpose at which they could excel. Right? In addition to single responsibility apps, we focused on the quality of the code within them. The last thing we wanted to do was to repeat the coding mistakes uh, that we made earlier. Right? So one primary gauge that we used to guard against reincarnating that code was that of Code cohesiveness or application cohesiveness. Um, and you know, a few weeks ago, a few months ago, Glenn Vanderberg had a really nice blog post in which he discusses cohesive code versus adhesive code. And he takes a kind of etymological approach in which he says, he talks about cohesion, um, the, the root of the term cohesion, which has the concept of sticking. Um, things that are cohesive naturally stick to each other because they are alike or of the same kind. Right? Because they, they, they kind of naturally fit well together. Right? So these are like pieces that fit, fit together well for, uh, for requalification and for delivery. Cohesion stands in contrast to adhesion. So when something adheres to something else, when it's <laughs> adhesive, uh, yeah, it's, right? it's a one-sided kind of external thing. Something like uh, duct tape sticking one to one way to, to another. All right? So clearly the legacy pieces did not fit well together. They were stuck together. They were adhesive, not cohesive. All right? uh, okay, so asynchronousness. We also wanted to offload as much functionality as possible to the message of consumers. Long-running Ruby applications that listen to cues for messages. Um, those messages represent, would represent events um, that could trigger the delivery of the leads, for example. Right? So the legacy app originally delivered leads to clients synchronously. And the synchronous delivery created a terrible user experience because it was dependent upon the response from the client. Right? Um, when the user selected more than one school, he or she had to wait for the application to cycle through each delivery. Right? Processing delivery asynchronously, however, completely alleviated that problem. So when a user submitted their, their data, the legacy app could um, simply fire a message and forget and move on. Furthermore, now we can load balance for high volume traffic, running multiple instances of the service, all of them competing for messages off of our delivery queue. <coughs> Varying response times mattered less because deliveries were being processed in parallel and all of this happened behind the scenes, right? So the user was basically on the The most obvious impact was increased speed and responsiveness of the monolithic Rails app. More important effects, however, were less obvious. Now, uh, messaging in particular, uh, and this is a messaging specific point, now, because messaging facilitates the, can facilitate the creation of highly decoupled applications and services. And it allows independent applications to communicate simply and easily. In, in our particular case, we format our messages with JSON, and uh, we decided upon a simple and straightforward vocabulary or contract in each application to speak for um, a year or two. So, uh, finally, we, we took baby steps. We wanted to iterate all of these changes into place. Let's take a look at delivery again. Um, in order to offload delivery from the legacy system, we first wanted to define a, a boundary between the old and the new system. On one side of the boundary, you had new delivery, uh, self-contained Ruby consumer listening for messages on a, on a delivery queue. And on the other was a router. Right? And it was wedged in at the legacy point of delivery in our model with the Rails app. So in, in 
finally, we added uh, a new field to the uh, school's table so that the router could determine whether or not the school had been ad activated for the new delivery service. We could easily activate schools for the new service, adding them to one by one at first, and then later in batches, uh, where we more, when we were more confident uh, with the, in the delivery service. Moreover, it was simple to roll anyone back to the legacy delivery if there were problems, right? So they're flipping a switch in the, in the database. Now, this boundary was permeable for the legacy code. It could publish out to the new service, but the, the service could not you know, talk back. Thus, the router had to, adapt, had to adapt or map the data to the new service via a simple delivery mapper. And then it published that data to, to the delivery queue. Right. In this way, we ran old and new in parallel for weeks or even months before finally letting the new service completely strangle the, the legacy delivery. Right. At which point, we could deprecate the battle of code um, and so <coughs> Continue to strangle legacy code over and over again, one, one service at a time, basically. All right? Furthermore, the router and the mapper uh, were basically throwaway code. They were temporary insertions in the legacy system to facilitate communication with the shiny new system. Uh, the added column to the school's table was intended from the beginning to be deprecated um, as well. So they all you know, kind of served a, a temporary purpose. Okay, what did we gain? Speed, for one. Um, your system's going to be faster when you run, run a bunch of your business logic in the background on distributed servers, right? It's also easier to isolate and work on, on performance bottlenecks, you know, because problems are, are framed now um, through a more fine-grained lens. You know, for example, the lead qualification service is slow as opposed to the monolithic rails app is slow, you know, and the app is slow. So. All right, we also gain um, maintainability. Right? So small, well-factored applications that have a single overarching responsibility are easier to maintain than monolithic apps. Uh, and I think it's all, it can also be easier to debug because you have, a, once again, a more fine-grained sense of where your problems are occurring. Right? Testability. So on, testing is easier when your apps are small and they have focused responsibilities. Right? And or maybe, you know, most importantly, or most interestingly, um, we gain composability. Right? So independent, well-defined services are like Lego blocks. And for us, that made it easy, easy to support multiple operational channels. So greater flexibility makes it easier to adapt to changes in business models, which is extremely important for small and medium-sized businesses because they tend to live in a kind of innovation mode. So if your system looks like a chain of nodes, it's simple to add new functionality. You just add, you know, plug a node into the chain. And the existing pieces can be recomposed to form additional operational channels as business needs change. In our, play, in our case, the lead qualification was an entry point to our system. And it can also potentially serve as a router for more than one operational channel. Furthermore, by decoupling lead qualification from a monolithic Rails app, it, became a, it essentially became a client of a lead gen subdomain. And with that, the uh, business could realistically start thinking about uh, expanding into different related verticals like em employment or loan financing or even building out uh, you know, mobile versions or surveying. One of the architectural goals um, that we have is to move towards an event-driven system where each service publishes an event stream of its activities to, uh, so that other services may that the other services may, or services may subscribe to and then filter or act upon. Right? So for example, if we if the delivery service delivers a lead, it could then publish out an event describe or a, a message describing that event, right? Which any um, any uh, Interested party could subscribe to and you know and then do with what they want with that message, right? Um, you know, by and large, you want to minimize your dependencies between services as much as possible, and this is where you know event driven, this kind of event driven approach is, is really really excels or allows you to uh, excel. All right, so what did we risk? Um, there was a lot to you know we thought there was a lot to gain. Um, uh, to gain from this approach, but what are we risk, right? So maintainability, 
uh, it's kind of flip side of the, the, of the uh, coin. Um, because although single responsibility services and apps are easy to maintain in isolation, we now have coordinated collections of services that we're responsible for, all right, and that can cause maintenance headaches. You know, in particular, coordinated deployments um, you know, can be very labor intensive and can be a headache. You know, further in one, this is um, one of the more important points about the. Uh, of this talk, uh, you know, furthermore, moving from a monolithic Rails app to a service-oriented architecture, um, we did not really remove complexity, um, we simply distributed it. All right? We offloaded it from a single application to the relationship between a collection of applications. Um, this was a calculated trade-off that we thought was worth it, but your team may decide differently. Um, you, have to weigh, you have to weigh those the pros and cons uh, you know, on a case-by-case -case basis. Like so um, ask yourself, you know, about the makeup, the makeup or skill set of your team. You know, do you have anyone who's done messages before? Anybody who's worked on a cell before? Does your team have good integration tools? Does your team test? Um, you know, what is the inherent complexity of your domain? You know, if it's not that complex, maybe you just want to refactor the legacy app into submission. All right, and then testability. All right, once again, flip side of the same point, all right? Um, and I want to make some general comments here about testing, and I'll leave the more detailed approach to Brian um, who's following me. Because um, so in many ways, testing is easier uh, when your apps are small and have focused responsibilities, right? But testing the behavior of all of your services together, um, or even a subset of those services, can be can be challenging. So, so what do you do? Um, well, you know, you pick your battles carefully. I think. And, you know, here I want to shine the spotlight on um, messaging. So, for example, like a uh, lead delivery uh, service. All right. So basically, we got away with just writing integration tests for individual services and not trying to write really comprehensive integration <coughs> tests. All right. So, and I think you know that up to this point has been more or less sufficient. Um, this is probably because messaging consumers tend to be or should be highly coupled um, applications. So. Uh, you know, if a consumer does make a synchronous call to another service, then you know we would include that. For example, delivery edit, contact, you know, make a, a request to a budgeting service. You know, that would sort of have you know a budgeting service fire up and you know, you know make that part of the overall uh, integration or integration test. But but it's, you know creating integration tests that run the gamut from you know surveying a visitor, qualifying a lead, delivering a lead. Remarketing the email, checking conversion seems like overkill. Um, you know, because if your applications are well defined and low on dependencies, I think the integration tests can be kind of isolated to to those apps or those services and their immediate dependencies. Okay. One other big gotcha um, about you know, as far as moving towards a more service oriented approach is um, overly deep services. The more services you have, the more complicated your architecture becomes. So you want to guard against the proliferation of services. And keep them fo you want to keep them focused on your core business needs, right? Here I want to bring an example from a, a different company where I'm currently working, but um, which is also in the region industry. Right? Um, so we have, we have some applications that need to share logic for formatting fields on lead, and we, um, and we also needed a rules engine and several apps could utilize, right? And it was tempting to simply set up a couple of Sinatra apps with RESTful APIs that anybody could hit. Um, but we're playing with a different approach. This is an approach, um, you know, inspired by the Android and the Fund, um, uh, that does not involve the addition of, of two more services, right? In short, we put the field formatting logic in a separate gem that any Ruby app can include. And we're running local instances of cache, of cache DB on the servers that host those apps back as you know, kind of caches for any configuration data um, that the gem may need. And we're considering doing the same with uh, our rules engine. Those local cache DB instances simply replicate from a master instance that are, are you know, then an admin application we write to. Um, and in this way, we're, we're able to leverage the simple but powerful syncing capabilities of cache DB to limit our services and to keep them more aligned with core business functionality. Right? So finally, uh, one last gotcha, one last risk, one last risk is 
um, the pair out shift, right? So, and this is, you know, when you move from monolithic rail path to, uh, to a more service-oriented architecture, uh, especially when you start using messaging, um, you, um, you have to deal with this paradigm shift, right? Because you, you, you no longer have a call stack. You know, the, and the call stack brings with it the security assumptions. Right? Synchronous calls in which the caller should know what happens next, right? But, but in this scenario, those assumptions are, are gone. In this architecture, those assumptions are gone. You, know, you have applications that send fire messages and, and forget. Something else is, is uh, you know, something else has to, you know, is assumed to be processing um, that further connection. So more of you need to start thinking about recovery strategies when services go down or, or you know when exceptions are exceptions are thrown in a service that um, prevents the processing of, of, of a request or a message. And furthermore, conceptualizing and programming towards an architecture where behavior is distributed um, and can run in parallel, uh, as opposed to an architecture where all behavior can exist in one place, requires a real shift in thinking on the developer's part. So, along those lines, you really want to map your architecture, right? And, and because the system is easily evolvable, like easily evolvable, um, you need to create a way to visualize and even manage the configuration of your system, right? Could be as simple as generating maps of the domain, uh, or sub of your domain or, or subdomains, but but you basically should you should be treating uh, the composition of your system as an additional layer the overall architecture. Okay. All right, in summary, if you find a similar story playing out for you at work, consider the plot line that we took. Right. Gradually replace your monolith rails out by strangling it one service at a time. Make sure those services are closely tied to core business needs. Process as much business logic asynchronously as you can. Take baby steps. Iterate your changes in and don't be afraid to run the old and the new in, in parallel for a while. But be smart about it because service orientation and messaging are not without parallel, right? Particularly you have a maintenance toll, a testing toll, over decomposition, um, and a, a paradigm shift to worry about. So these should all be measured against the rewards that you hope to reap before you close that legacy chapter and decide to turn over a new these are some helpful links and some helpful books. And thank you. Any questions? Uh, it seems it seems clear that we should separate functions. But what doesn't seem clear to me is we should necessarily do it as many services that have found even if ob good object orientation is a separation. Yep. It's clear that we should be separating responsibilities, but that we need to go so far as separating um, separating functionality out into different services, as opposed to um, you know separating them out into different different objects within the same application. Um, and sure, you know, if, I, I think you need to make uh, you know that, that that's a that's a judgment you need to make based on um, the the amount of complexity and. and uh, you know, on a case by case basis, because um, you know, for us, delivery or qualifying a lead or delivering a lead, those were reasonably complex, uh, complex um, endeavors, and so you know, we made the choice to to separate those out as, as separate services, and it was just you know, we felt like you know, you know, your other point was that, that you know, maybe we could have just had them all as part of one big code base, one big Rails app. It just ran on different servers, but um, it, you know, in that case, you know, Rails, Rails was like a hammer, and not everything was a nail, right? So it was just much simpler to write a simple <coughs> little Ruby consumer, or, or a smaller uh, library, a smaller Ruby consumer that could handle.
channel delivery. It could grow and expand and extend on its own you know, because it has one focus responsibility. We don't have to worry about it weighing down the rest of you know, the stack. So, um, All right, thank you. Uh, you said that you had some tests that ran the services against each other. Yeah. What tool is that useful for you know, making sure that both services are started up? Or is that you know, we've been trying to set everything yep. to services, but now you have the dependency of having these services running in certain situations, so it's really hard to manage. All right, all right. So, I mean, you know, giving this an example of uh, lead delivery. Uh, so in the, in the case of delivery, let's, let's we, we had, you know, on the one hand, you know, the end point of that service was to actually deliver a lead to the client. We certainly didn't want that to be part of our test. So we started out using fake web, and I think maybe still be using fake web, but I would actually advocate using something else like, um, I mean, Mimic. It's a relatively new application that actually you know, spawns, I think you heard of that um, I think we moved right path. It'll actually, um, it, you know, it'll spin up a little sonographer for you that you can configure to respond to different URLs, and you know, so you can actually have you know, some sort of, you know, uh, you know, an application out there that, that is, you know, receiving requests and giving responses instead of using fake web, which basically just, you know, monkey patches net HTTP. Um, so that, you know, so that's one case. But but as far as, um, uh, you know, let's say you have Delivery, which is also communicated with the budgeting service, um, spinning up uh, you know, the budgeting service as well. You can do something like um, Tim Harper's excellent background. Is it background job? Or is there <coughs> something called service manager? Uh, service manager. Yeah. And what's the name, Tim? Background and process. Background and process. Yeah. Yeah. That's um, yeah. for running processes in the background and monitoring your output. Yeah. Yeah, and that's how I, you know even like with. Um, Messaging consumers using something like that kind of process to you know kind of spin them up, run them in the background, uh, using whatever you know, getting on a script you know, instead of actually trying to thread them or something. So, yeah. Did you ever run into problems of like like batching where the instead of dropping a, a, a bead from node to node to node to node, you had ten things that happened in this node that need to be carried to the next node but need to be treated together. It's like the n plus one problem in SQL. Yeah. Um, did you just design, just stay away from that from the design just in general? Yeah, that's some, some real dependencies there. Yeah. Okay. All right, we're actually going to have to call it there. So let's give Chris a round of applause.